time. to do things. Take your time. We're coming across all the channels. It's going to take a couple seconds. I probably need to like you from my... I don't think, I don't think you have to. <laughs> no, I already do like you, but uh, uh. the Facebook like, business, business, the Facebook business page is like changed. So I actually have to like go into that profile to do anything. And um, it just, it's always goofy. All right, I got you here. So let's share. Now, share public. And then I'll go back. For everybody that's watching, this is Rigor Swivels. He's trying to do IT stuff. No, no, keep going. Don't bother me. I'm just talking to everybody that's watching. That's all. He's trying to share the love. Uh, that's what I like, man. It's all good. We haven't even officially started. So uh, even though we got people commenting already, I love awesome, it. Awesome. I love it. I love it. I love it. I right. think we're good. While James is sitting there doing all the IT stuff, I'm going to do all the fly stuff. And we are back. Here I am, Fly Navarro, with the No BS World Tour, coming at you live all across social media. Today, I got Mr. James Turner from Ringer Swivels. Good afternoon, Mr. Turner. Hey, Fly, how are you? Thanks for having me on. Man, no worries. Thank you for making the time. Uh, I truly appreciate it. Uh, I know you're a busy man. Um, you Fishing is not your number one business uh it is not so i know you have a very very busy schedule so uh number one welcome to the no bs world tour uh it's funny we just self-proclaim that we're all around the world and uh we're growing non-stop exactly. it never stops growing everywhere and that's what we like to do so big shout out to uh edgar scott from real alaska fishing charters and susan dalton good to see you guys uh James, how the hell are you, brother? I'm good, man. I'm good. You, we had a little snow today for some reason. It was 76 <laughs> degrees yesterday, and it snowed a little bit today. So the weather's got me a little thrown off. But Where, where are you, for everybody that's asking, uh, where are you? Yeah, so I live in uh, Chestertown, Maryland, okay. on the eastern shore, about an hour and a half north of the uh, famous Ocean City Sunset Marina area, White Marlin open stuff. Nice. So... Uh, before we get into the nitty gritty of it, first of all, you're on the Eastern shore, which, uh, is, makes me jealous because, uh, not only do you guys have great fishing inshore and offshore, you guys have some of the best hunting around. Oh yeah. You oh, guys yeah. got great duck hunting, hunting, duck hunting, deer hunting, uh, you name it, you guys got it. Yeah, we definitely, uh, as soon as fishing season kind of transitions out, come uh, like September, October, you know, there's like a switch that hits in the eastern shore and people just uh, dive in and uh, and hunting season begins, you know. Is it really an end of fishing? Because your white marlin bite has been going on way late the last few years. It seems like every year is like an extra two or three days. And it's like, yeah, sometimes it's yeah. like third week of September and they're still biting. You yep, know? Yep. So yeah. So yeah, usually don't. Is, um, good. No, no. I was just gonna say, is it really a an end date, or is it kind of like a okay, it's blowing. I'm gonna go sit in my tree stand. Yeah. Oh, it's flat <laughs> calm. I'm going offshore. Yeah. The um and and I'll tell you what's also uh, extended the fishing season too be, uh, beyond white marlin season is uh you know the daytime sport fishing out of uh out of mid Atlantic and um guys are really uh really getting into that even into i don't know some guys went in november or not um but uh yeah to answer your question i don't think i don't think my switch really goes off until closer to halloween you know that's the uh you know the bucks all start getting fired up for the rut and uh that's when my uh that's when my transition kind of happens from stopping thinking about fishing for a little bit no no I, listen i totally get it uh, that I get. Um, I know when I'm giant tuna fishing, we're doing September and October and we'll tuna fish in the morning. Then I go hunt in the afternoon nice. and it, it really works out great. There's, there's something to be said. I know a lot of people complain about uh, the three fish release rule they have up in Canada, but it doesn't bother me uh, because 
I get to go hunting in the afternoon. It's like I fish right. in the morning. I do all my work midday and by about three, four o'clock, I can go sit in the woods and hang out with bears. Right. Tell me a little bit about, uh, more about the three fish release uh, thing that you speak of for someone who hasn't really gone up north and done the, uh, the giant tuna fishing like you have. So um, up in Nova Scotia, first of all, Canada is a very regulated fishery. Uh, and it's kind of interesting for me because being here from Florida, uh, I'm so used to recreational fishing. So being so large, well, in Canada, there's really no recreational fishery. You're either commercial or you don't fish. Oh, wow. So, yeah. Like I've even asked, I'm like, man, I, I really want to go halibut fishing. And it's like, well, we don't have a permit. I go, well, I'm not trying to sell it commercially. I just want to go catch a halibut and, uh, have some fish for the month that i'm up here nope all right can't do it mm. i can go to one of the boats and buy it but i can't go out and catch it so uh the bluefin fishery was always just a a, a catch fishery catch and kill well uh because of chartering and recreational and so many americans coming up um what they did is say okay we'll let you catch and release three and uh the reasoning behind that is they don't want you molesting with the fishery uh all day long uh you catch and you sure. release your three and then you're done and then before you know yeah. it i mean when fishing's good um we're usually done at about 10 a.m 10 30 wow. and we're leaving the dock at five and we're done by 10 10 30 hour back to the dock then you're eating lunch and the great thing about, at least for me, and I've really never charter fished in my career. Uh, one, one thing that I've enjoyed is the fact that um, when you catch your third fish, everybody, it's a high note. Uh, how many fishing yeah. days have you had where you've caught like four by seven o'clock? Then you don't see another fish all damn day long. And mm. by four o'clock, you're like, man, what? what a horrible day. But then you get back to the dock and you're like, Oh, I forgot. We caught four first thing this morning. So, um, with the three, you know, you, you end on a high note. You, you always seem to end on a high note. Uh, if they're telling, if people are texting you saying they see you live, <laughs> well, tell them to comment and ask some questions, man. There you go. Uh, Brian, Brian Billick with, uh, the, uh, electricity um company oh okay that's the same one that uh oh my gosh uh allison works for allison yeah yeah allison okay. fished with us uh white marlin open this year okay allen's cool she's cool people oh she's yeah cool yeah. people and you know what we're going to continue talking a little bit about this canadian fishery because mom is on the line uh nice. captain curtis who i go fishing with while i'm up there his mother's on the line every third day of fishing she provides us with a whole box of fresh fried haddock mm. we have a we have a seafood day we have uh snow crabs we have seafood chowder lobster rolls and mum's fried haddock that's so good there's no wonder i put on the canadian 10 when i go up there um but uh but yeah that's one of the things you, you catch your three and your day is done and it, it the fish have enough pressure on it from the commercial guys you know sure so instead of having a fishery that's constantly being pressured for 14 hours a day or 12 hours a day, you go in, you fish, and then you leave them alone for the rest of the day. Yeah. I like so it. I, I, I like it. I have no complaint. And, and truth be told, uh, after you catch three 800 pounders, <laughs> uh, most everybody's pretty tired. Yeah. Well, yeah, they're pretty tired. So that gives them time to go do some other stuff like, trout fishing or going hunting or sure. hiking or you know and me being a florida boy uh i had never seen leaves change until i went up to canada oh wow <laughs> i had never ever ever seen leaves change. i woke up one morning and walked out and it was wow what the yeah. f just happened yeah you know is so, that a uh a lot of uh, a lot of chair time or do driver cross seeing you in a stand-up outfit once or twice uh, I don't reel nothing in, man. I collect content, <laughs> There you go. but most everybody <laughs> is in the chair. Uh, there's a couple of people out there that'll do stand up, 
Uh, but most of our fighting, we're fishing 250 pound tests. We're putting 100 pounds oh, wow. of drag on these fish. Mm, that's the heat. I lift oh, you out of the chair a little bit. <laughs> oh, there's something to be said about putting 100 pounds of pressure on a fish, uh, and I, which I quite enjoy, yeah. to be honest with you. Uh, in today's world, and I'm not knocking anything, and I know, uh, and I'm going to give a lot of shit to all my buddies um, that are my age that are complaining about uh, how wiring a fish is a lot is is starting to lose the, its art form because so many people are fishing light leaders. And sure. hey, man, th at least what I was taught, my job is to go out there and catch as many damn fish as possible, whatever it takes. So if that means I got to go down to 80 pound test, I'm going to go down to 80 pound test. I don't care. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, we do learn we end up losing uh, as a whole, we l start losing certain techniques that aren't used anymore. One of them is proper wiring skills. Uh, one of them is proper gaffing skills with big fish. Uh, when you're a single man in a cockpit and you're just trying to, to gaff a big Dorado is one thing, but when you're trying to, you know, when you're trying to gaff a big fish and you need two or three guys, um, it's definitely one of those things that you have to learn how to communicate and work. Is it still blowing up at you? Uh, yeah, yeah. He was a, you're, you're a he superstar was a now, shot. dude. Big shot, he said. You're a superstar now, man. That's right. Listen, the whole world. Uh, now, uh, did, Richard's asking, and I don't know if we got the right thing. Uh, did Jim get his LPs back? Uh, I don't. Do you understand that? Jim. I don't know. Richard, uh, you, you're going to have to uh, elaborate. Elaborate. Elaborate a little bit. Uh, yeah, elaborate. The only. The only yeah. The only LPs in the gym I can think of is maybe Jim McGrath sharing something uh, from Grand Slam that I might have commented on or shared, but I'm not really too sure. Yeah, I, I'm not 100% too sure. I got so many things running around back and forth. Hey, it's Mark Pagano. What's going on, Mr. Pagano? Uh, Mr. Mark is the one that introduced me to the fishery in Canada, and uh, oh, wow. I, I get the opportunity of fishing with him every year, except for last year. Uh, right. because all the borders have been closed and we're, I know they extended the closure one extra month. They just put it out yesterday. Um, department of, I can't even, it DHS put it out yesterday. Sure. They're extending, but it seems like everybody's kind of extending one extra month, uh, right now. So are you going to, are you going to be clear come September, October this time you think, or yeah, uh, I don't know. Yeah. And, and for those of you that are listening to this, just an audio form, I gave him the, I don't know, shrug, uh, <laughs> man, I'll tell you what last year I canceled three tournaments last year. Uh, mm -hmm. this year I've already canceled three and I've created like another four. Uh, right, right. and all of them have like this contingency plan of what happens if you have to make it remote or what happens if you have to make it virtual. So, uh, listen, it just, it is what it is. You know, yeah. I, I try to build in the parameters that I'm allowed to build sure. and, and I go from there. I, I go from there. If it's like anything else. So, uh, this is what I want. And I try to build in that little space. And sometimes I step on people's toes and sometimes I don't and, uh, sure. and try to do what I'm allowed to do. So, yeah. And we've learned if anything over the last year to just, just be here more flexible, you know, exactly. You try to be flexible and try to, there's certain things I'm flexible with and there's certain things I'm not. Uh, yeah. And I don't necessarily want to get into all those things, uh, <laughs> but the people that know me know which, where I don't get flexible at. Uh, yeah. it, it's, it's been tough on everybody. Let's put it that way. And we're, we've been very lucky here in Florida. Uh, we've been able to go fishing this entire time. Yeah. <laughs> So that's, uh, for me, it's, it's been a great thing. Uh, and I know there's been early on, there was issues where certain marinas were closed or boat ramps were closed and stuff like that. Um, so now, you know, most places have some kind of normalcy to it. 
Uh, no. Some places are a little tougher. Uh, I'm assuming you got, cause I was up in ocean city this past summer. It was my first time there and crap. I think it was nine years. Uh, it wow. seemed like it was, yeah. And it might've even been longer than that. Um, it seemed like it was mostly normal. There were certain things that were restricted. Like if you went up to the bar uh stuff like that but all in all the marinas were open people were able to go fishing uh people were still having a good time which is good sure sure yeah absolutely yeah it didn't really uh seem like it skipped a beat other than the uh the spectator side of some of those big tournaments you know which is uh you know understandable but disappointing for some of the hundreds or thousands of people that that flocked ocean city to pack in there like sardines at uh harbor island and and watch fish get hung up you know and watch the boats back and slip it's amazing how many people come just to watch they take their week's vacation just to watch fish getting hanged yeah it's i it's had really a um I, I had the figures i interviewed jim mosco for a uh the uh the founder of the white marlin open tournament for a marlin magazine article and uh i had the figures on what they what their reach was and and I forget how many how many countries and and how many people stream it in and then on top of that the you know the influx to uh to the ocean city area it was just numbers it's crazy. numbers you and I would never expect you know well I just wrote I just wrote a paper well not a paper it was an article about uh the amount of money uh that is created by billfish tournaments sure and uh it's amazing it, people don't realize uh, how much money is brought in by recreational fishing. I know in the state of Florida alone, uh, recreational fishing is a $119 billion a year industry. Um, but we are also a 12 month out of the year industry. Right. You you're, still, ty you're you typing. Okay. All right. All right. Let me pull back up here. You still got me, right? I can see you. You're fine. Are you on your laptop okay. or you're on your phone? Yeah, yeah, laptop, laptop. Okay, no, no, you're you're loud and clear. So, cool. um, anyway, let's uh, let's talk a little bit about your company, uh, Rigger sure. Swi Rigger Swivels. Yep. Uh, tell us tell us a little bit about the history of Rigger Swivels. Sure, sure. So, um, I would say uh, back in February 2017, uh, I was down in Costa Rica with the uh, with the guys that I fished with uh, in the boat that I made for in the summertime up here in Ocean City uh, called the Sea Flame, the 62 Viking. Um, what's, what's, it called, what's it called? What's it called again? Sea Flame. Sea Flame. Okay. Yeah, it's a private boat, not charter, but uh, you know, a great group of guys, and we've all been together for a handful of years now, and I've been with them for I think this will be season number seven. And um, Sonny, who uh, our dock neighbor, uh, Jim Rogers, has a boat, First Light, a little yellow uh, 39 Gillikin Express boat that sits down in uh, Los Sueños and invites us down, you know, or, or at least uh, puts the offer out every season. So 2017, we went down there. And one of the days, uh, Jake Emsky, who used to fish um, with, the, uh, with the Bill Fisher Agitator Program, I believe, um, he jumped on for a day of. Uh, just to ride along with us and like uh, like most people uh, will ask you know what what's what's your secret you know how uh, how do you guys catch so many how do you always win you know is there uh, 19 marlin magnets in the hall or, or what are you guys doing differently and uh, you know uh, as we kind of had questions throughout the day and and just kind of picking his brain we uh, started going over how how fish feed inside out and how it's really important for circle hooks to be positioned basically facing the inside of the spread because of how Marlins feed and uh, when they pick up a bait and uh, you know, about different angles and things like that. And it just really kind of got my wheels turning. And I was like, man, if the hooks just, you know, pivot, you know, uh, you really wouldn't have to worry about, you know, when you're rigging just regular O-ring grommets, you know, your hook position and things like that. So hold that, hold that <clears throat> thought for a second and explain for the people that don't know, explain what an O-ring grommet is. Sure. Sure. So, um, traditionally, uh, in the, uh, in the bait rigging world, there's guys that rig with floss, uh, which is kind of sometimes called the Costa Rica X or the Costa Rica floss method or, or something along those lines, X on the head. And then, uh, you know, it kind of progressed towards, uh, guys that rig with barrel swivels, which would be 
basically a barrel swivel that slides through a metal hook and it's really hard to uh, kind of get in and out to pass the barb here, um, the, the metal ring. So um, what had kind of uh, started to transition, I think in like maybe it was 2012, 2013, guys really started uh, leaning towards rigging with just the O-ring and the O-ring would be attached to your bait. And uh, that would be the way that you would insert your hook when you swapped your baits out. Now, the flaw to O-ring rigging was that the hook stayed fixed in a certain position. So when, uh, when you go to free spool and you feed a fish, that hook's kind of uh, fixed in a certain direction based off of the orientation of the bait. And there's not the ability for the hook to kind of fully, fully rotate and find the corner of the mouth. So, <clears throat> um, yeah, so kind of seeing that, you know, so there's that's floss rigging, barrel swivel rigging, O-ring rigging, and then, um, what had uh, eventually started happening in like uh, probably 2016, 2017, a lot of mates were migrating towards a very, very large oversized barrel swivel. So just a metal swivel. And then they would take an O-ring, a loose O-ring, lick their finger, stick an O-ring on their finger and then chase it through the hook so that the uh, very large barrel swivel wouldn't slide off and wouldn't fall off the bait while you're trolling or while your bait skips out of the water every now and then. And, um, just to kind of come full circle and and uh the uh, the history of kind of where ringer swivels came from um you know as i was kind of putting these things together i was like man you know if we could just put an o-ring in a barrel swivel it would kind of solve the flaws of o-ring rigging where the hook is traveling in a fixed direction the entire time and doesn't give that good 360 degree rotation that allows the hook to pivot when it reaches uh any kind of resistance and and things like that and uh and then it would resolve the flaw of, uh, of the barrel swivel rigging, which would be, you know, when you get a change out of barrel swivel rig bait, a lot of times they're really hard to get past this pointy barb here. So the only person who's got pliers in the cockpit, usually the mate, you know, your guests and other anglers can't swap baits out because they can't get it past the barbs. So then you got to snip it off and cut it off. And it's a lot of time with your head down and not a whole lot of time, uh, you know, staring at your spread and uh, maybe missing that dorsal come up on a teaser or something like that. So it's kind of where Ringer Swivels was born. I just said, you know, there's got to be a way. And if I had a dollar for every time somebody said, uh, you know, Hey man, how are you getting in there? I've been thinking of that for years. I just didn't know how to get the O-ring in there and stuff like that. Uh, man, it would, I'd probably be rich, but. You probably wouldn't be selling them. <laughs> yeah. Right. You but, wouldn't um, need to sell them. Yeah, but I've always kind of had a little uh, entrepreneurial mindset, I guess you could say, and uh, and I kind of went all in, and um, and through trials and tribulation, I mean, we're still improving uh, on the product as much as we can based off the feedback from a lot of our customers and things like that, and uh, we as in me, um, <laughs> you know, it's uh, it's definitely been a, a fun venture, and uh could be more grateful for all the sport fishing community support really it's such a uh such a small supportive family it's really hard to describe you know this uh this little uh industry that we're in you know it's i i tell everybody it's like a fraternity yep it doesn't matter where in the scope you are uh and i didn't spend that much time in college um but people who went to a big university and were part of a fraternity. It's one of those things where, Hey, listen, I was in that fraternity 20 years ago. You're one of my brothers. We'll get you a job. Well, it's the same thing. Uh, Absolutely. You, run in, you run into somebody from 20 years ago or you're new and uh, Hey, come on, we'll help you. You know? So yep. that, that's the way the fraternity works. So over the um, Abby Jones is asking, uh, where can you get the ringer swivels mm. that we were going to wait for later, but go ahead, throw it out yeah. there right now. So, uh, right now at this time, ringer swivels are for sale in, uh, the majority of your offshore tackle shops in, I think we're in 13 countries now, 15 States. So, uh, depending on your location, uh, we're also on the, uh, premier online retailers, uh, Melton tackle, tackle direct, all tackle squid nation and um the tackle room a couple of these other online uh tackle shops that do really well with offshore uh products so that's 
there you go, Abby, if you want to find them. And if not, you can find them on social media because I see them on social media all the time. Yep. And there's actually, uh, now that you mentioned, I have a map that I, uh, a map that I built on the website at the bottom on the, on the homepage, showbringerswivels.com, scroll down to the bottom, and it has an interactive map where you can zoom and see all of the little tags and all the tackle shots that we're in. So, um, you know, Australia, Costa so, Rica, United Ab States. Abby is in Moorhead City, North Carolina. Moorhead City. So our big North Carolina um, tackle shops, obviously, uh, would be uh, Ocean's East Nags Head, uh, EJW, um, Chase and Tail, Saltwater Bait and Tackle. You don't have this. I mean, you have to really think about this. You don't know this right off the top of your head? Oh, it's all from the top. I just want, I'm, <laughs> what I'm thinking of is not forgetting one of the important ones and then here, here and, so this here is what we're going to do I, i'm going to lay the disclaimer for any tackle shop in north carolina that james misses it's 100 percent my fault because i made him nervous before we got on air so <laughs> we'll blame it on that or That'll it's the, or it's the fact that his kids didn't get the macaroni and cheese that they wanted before he came on air and yeah they all uh, wanted peanut butter and jelly instead i had a bison burger when you said, oh, okay, two o'clock, I had, uh, I made bison burgers this weekend and a leftover oh, cool. patty. Yeah. I went, uh, I went bison hunting back in January with some friends and I came back with way too much bison. <laughs> I didn't even kill one. Cause I'm like, wait a second. There's six of us. You guys kill five. I'm like, nah, it's, I just want to look, it's me and my girlfriend at the house. It's not like I, I'm feeding a, a wolf pack. Right. So I came back with 123 pounds of ground bison and we're still going uh and it's delicious did i lose you no you no i had you there i was just uh just double checking uh, you, while i was listening yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah i'm watching you i'm losing your concentration man you're good you're good it was a uh it was a quick phone glance there okay trying to right. uh trying to think if i missed any of my north carolina guys because they're certainly uh north carolina florida and ocean city uh so they just they do so well uh with ringer swivels and don't want to disappoint anybody no 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 i get it i get it like i said you got to put out the disclaimer hey if it's yep. if he misses one it's my fault call me uh i do have a suggestion box and you're welcome to put all complaints in the suggestion box <laughs> um yeah. it's right outside the front door so just drop it out there and uh let me know we'll be, we're more than happy to uh and i ain't got nothing out there I listen, if I had to listen to every time somebody complains, I'd never get anything done. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? Oh my gosh. I was talking, I, I don't even want to throw them under the bus, but somebody was mentioning to me, what happens? Aren't you concerned if you upset somebody? I'm like, man, if I worry about all the people I upset, I'd never yep. get anything done. You know, and I feel bad. Don't get me wrong, but I can't worry. I, you know, I try to do the best that I can. And if I can get, sure. if I can keep 95% of the people happy, pff, doing pretty good. I'm doing phenomenal 95. I know I wake up yeah. in the morning, I piss off at least five people just by waking up. <laughs> you know, <laughs> the moment I yeah. post something online, they're like, damn it, he made it through another night. <laughs> oh, that's funny. <laughs> So oh. yeah, it just, it is what it is, man. So, uh, so you started this back in 2017. Now 18, I know 18, 18, yep. 18. Okay. May, May, 2018. I had, uh, culpa. Proverbial doors. Yeah. Mail culpa, mail culpa. Sorry. Sorry. I heard you say 2017. Yeah, so 17 and... was when the idea triggered and then the, uh, trying to figure out how to make it work all, all world until, uh, May, 2018. And, uh, I opened the proverbial doors and shout out to my uncle Billy. He was the first one person I got on my website. He'll never use my swivels, but he bought two packs to have the kindness of his heart. And, and, uh, that was my first sale. And that's kind of, uh, it's been uh, pedal to the metal ever since. That's pretty cool. Now, yeah. I, and not listen, I know if you go on your website and I'm going to ask you about it here in a second, mm -hmm. you put up the amount of money that has been won by using your swivel, but that's not the question I'm going to ask you. How many swivels since 2018, May 2018, till now, 
2021, whatever month we were in April. Um, how many swivels do you think you've gone through? Almost 1.5 million. Yes. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. It's, uh, it's the only way, the only word to describe it is, is humbling, you know, um, it's, uh, you know, some of these, some of these sport fishing operations and some of these boats that use, uh, that use my swivel, um, were boats that I looked up to, you know, when I had first got into the sport fishing industry and they were, oh my gosh, those guys are awesome. And then to, to see them, you know, reach out to me and have conversations with these guys and, and, or walk the docks, uh, during tournament season and walk past uh, a mate rigging bait and see a bundle of copper wire there with ringer swivels on and just kind of tapping them on the shoulder and, and introducing myself. It's, uh, it's cool, man. No, that's very, 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 very humbling. What you should do is just when you see them rigging it, tap them on their back and say thank you and hit them up with a sticker right on their shoulder. Yeah, the fly sticker. Yeah, man, <laughs> there those, it is. Those things, those things are everywhere. I have one here on my computer, uh, and I don't have one lying around loosely. So, but I I put those things everywhere. I see. I, and and, I and see it wasn't even me. It wasn't even me that started it. Who, uh, who was the brains behind that? Was that Garrett? I, I'm not a hundred percent sure. I think, and this is 100% just a guess. I think it might've been Tucker on the, uh, special situation, but I'm not, a, I'm not a hundred percent sure all. And I know the picture. So the picture was, I had just finished putting on, uh, my event in Saudi Arabia. It was the first ever, international fishing tournament in saudi arabia and me and my business partner uh, over there and his uh and his sons and a bunch of other guys from the from the government we went out to uh, a local seafood restaurant mm -hmm. and uh the boats pull up right to the back of the seafood restaurant and the fish comes into the fish house and it's uh the, you know you put out whatever you want and you get a bucket and you grab what you want, and then you bring it over to the guy, uh, and then you say, okay, I want these two fried, and these two baked, and these two this, and you go on and go forth. Anyway, long story short, uh, once you pay for everything, get everything all situated, then you go to uh, your room. It was, you know, that instead of having a, like a table, there was a couple tables, right. but if you're a big enough party, they walked us down this enormous building and you have this room and I bet you we could have sat 30 people in there. There was probably only 12 of us. You could have sat 30 people in there. And um, when they brought us the fish and it was fish and rice and all kinds of stuff to go with it. I mean, it was a giant feast. Well, one of the snappers we picked out when it, when they fried it, its mouth froze open. So I, they're like, here, have a whole fish. And I grab this thing and I hold the fish and I'm like, and I look just like the fish and somebody took a picture. So I posted it on social. Well, somebody grabbed that picture. And again, I, I'm saying it's Tucker, but I don't know if it's Tucker or not. No. And, uh, and they cut it out. They, and they stuck it up all over Ocean City uh, during the white Marlin open a couple years right. ago. And like I said, I hadn't been to ocean city in at least like nine years. So next thing you know, I'm getting all these phone calls. Hey man, you're putting your stickers all over ocean city. Can I get some? And I'm like, <laughs> that ain't me, man. I haven't been in ocean city in forever. So long story short, I see it. I'm like, man, what a cool idea. So yeah. I, I, I grabbed them. And now any piece of mail that goes out of my house has a company logo and my face logo on it. And yeah, yeah, I remember hearing that on one of your other, uh, your other podcasts. That was really cool. At, like when uh, we were doing all the book sales, all the book sales have my face on it. Um, any Calcutta stuff I do, I slap on a, my sticker on it. I want you to look at my face before you open up the envelope. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but it's also pretty funny cause you know, you stick them on, on people's, uh, bumpers and you stick it on their license plates and, uh, listen, stop I box, do, stop man, signs. man, I do a lot of stuff just for shits and giggles. I do it for fun. And, uh, I was talking to one of my business partners yesterday. We were talking about one of the projects we have going on and, 
he's like, well, what do you think? I says, you know what I think? I says, if it's not fun, I ain't going to do it. So you can, yeah. you know, uh, you better find something that's fun to do. Cause, uh, unlike, I mean, for people that don't know me, most everybody that's watching or listening knows who I am. I, I'm not, I've never been married. I have no children. So it's, I mean, I don't have a biological legacy to leave. So what I'm right. doing, all the stuff I do is to try, try to make our fishing community better. Uh, yeah. th th that's why I do 90% of the stuff I do. If I can do something that makes our industry better or makes it easier for people to, to access, I'm going to do it. Sure. Um, yeah. And I'm cool with that. And if I do something that I'm not going to make money on, but I'm going to have a good time doing it, I'm going to do it, yep. you know? And there's been plenty of times I've put stuff together and, you know, I break even or I might lose a couple bucks. Uh, but if I had a good time and everybody had a good time, then it's a win-win, oh, you yeah. know? And uh, that's what I look for. I look for things that are going to be fun to do and, um, and I try to get as many people involved in it. And those stickers was, yeah. And I've had a couple of people, you know, people can make fun of you about that. Again, if you think I'm worried about people making fun of me, right? Uh -uh, I, I don't care. I mean, if you get a laugh, first of all, I laugh at myself first thing in the morning. Ha ha ha. All them <laughs> bastards that are pissed off that I woke up. I made it again. <laughs> yeah, right. That's funny. But listen, you know, again, life is too short to be miserable Certainly. you know and you definitely and, have a uh, a fun fun follows fly around you yeah. know wherever you're going there's there's people that are smiling and laughing or you're doing something half goofy and uh, that's and uh and that's what i try to have to a do. sense of humor you you yeah. have to have a sense of humor and you have to have a good time and uh it for me it, I, that's why i've been very lucky and uh, you know, I pick where I want to go and what I want to do because I want people to have a good time. And, um, I've, I've fished plenty of times where people get upset and man, I don't want to do that. I, I hate yeah. that. I want people, you know, a couple of years ago, I had some friends, Oh, did you fish the, I don't know if it was the white Marlin opener or the mid Atlantic. And I'm like, man, I didn't go do that. And they're like, what'd you do? I saw these blue Marlin pictures. I'm like, man, I went to the fads. I took these two Cuban brothers who had only caught one blue marlin between the two of them. And I took them out to the fads and they caught 19 blue marlins in two and a half days. I go, and they missed, they probably missed another 25. They didn't care. Right, right. They did not care. Oh, they caught fish and, you know, and I, I've, I'm 47. I'm going on 48 years old. Uh, I've been doing this since I was 19 and I've done some really cool shit. And I, and I love every minute of it and I don't discount anything I've done or anybody else has done. But one thing I enjoy is watching our sport through other people's eyes. Okay. And, um, I, I love taking out people that have never been fishing before. Uh, I love people that have, uh, taking people out that have never caught a billfish before they've seen it. Uh, I don't know if you've seen them on Instagram, but Tarzan, uh, I get, it seems like every Friday I get a phone call or every like Wednesday, Hey, uncle fly, you want to go fishing on Friday? Yeah, let's go. And uh, yeah, he's 12 years old. We go, we go wait. His mom doesn't want him to go waiting by himself. And I don't blame her. He's 12. Right. You know, right. she's like, I don't want him to get stuck in the mud. You know, he's all of, you know, four foot something. So we go, we go waiting and I keep my phone on me. I get work done during the day. But I've taken him out. He's caught his first two sailfish with me. Uh, I've got plenty of other friends. I've taken them out, catch their first blue marlin. I talked to a buddy of mine. We've been friends since we were in the. How old are you? Uh, what grade are you in when you're six? We've been we've been friends since we were six, and I was just talking to him this morning, and he's like, "You know, you ruined me." I'm like, "I don't know what you're talking about, but I'm afraid <laughs> to ask." And he goes, "My brother just called me up and asked me to go fishing with him this weekend," and I told him, "No." And I'm like, why'd you do that? He goes, man, after going to coast, uh, going to Guatemala with you, I don't want to go fishing out here. Right. Uh, he's been, a little bit. Yeah. He's been after me for, for years. I want to buy a boat. I want to buy a boat. And I'm like, you're busy. You're, you're a working person. You, you run a company, you got a bunch of employees. You maybe get a day and a half off a week. Uh, I'm like, you don't want to buy a boat. I go charter one or buy a little boat and take your, you know, your kids to the beach. 
Uh, if you want to go fishing, call me up and I'll set you up with one of my buddies and you go fishing. Sure yeah. enough. Uh, but that's the kind of stuff I enjoy. I love that. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I love that, you know, and one of my, it, uh, one of my dear friends, uh, Marshall, we fished the big fish classic, uh, the Huck big fish classic at ocean city. And he's fished with us the last, uh, last two tournaments and primarily a rock fish guy, a, uh, you know, some tuna fishing, uh, but the rock fishing's uh, like a trolling and no offense to rock fishing or, or tuna fishing, but, um, you know, when, when people catch their first billfish or hook their first billfish on their own, they kind of see, you know, why, uh, why you're catching releasing and kind of, uh, see the art and see the interaction and the, uh, the challenge. And, uh, so during the big fish classic, uh, we had a, uh, we had a really, uh, really good tournament two years ago. We would have been uh, either tied top release boat, uh, didn't get in release money, but it would just, uh, everything came together and, and it was incredible. And, and typically a, a new guest or a new angler isn't holding a rod or, uh, or hooking fish just because of how the flow of the cockpit goes. And uh, he picked up a long rigger when somebody went to lunch and, <laughs> and he got a bite and he was like, oh, I got something to happen. And I looked down and he's got both of his thumbs are on the spool and his thumbs are burning i'm like no thumbs off the spool oh whatever just lock it up and then he locked it up and he and he caught his first billfish that's you know? awesome and uh and then so when we fished uh the tournament again this year you know he was on the left long rigger and uh the flat line however the rotation was and he was just uh he was stoked and ready for his next bite and then had a couple opportunities and that's what bill fishing is all about so being that you bring up that story, I'm going to tell you, I, I just, uh, I was talking with Haynes Hoffman earlier and I was telling him we're going to, we're going to launch it here soon. The official tournament competition, let me not call it a tournament. It's a competition it starts. Sure. It'll start uh, Memorial weekend, but the videos can be post dated. It doesn't have to happen during, uh, the summertime, but from Memorial through labor day, we're having a new contest, um, I, and I'm waiting for the artwork to come back right now. We are going to hold, are you familiar with the billfish baptism? I'm sure you are billfish. Mm -hmm. When you catch your first billfish, you get thrown in the water. Yes, sir. Uh, we are holding a contest for who, ha whoever has the best billfish baptism video will win a two day, uh, trip for two at Casa Vieja Lodge. Oh man. So, um, David's a good friend of mine and so yep. is his wife. And, uh, whenever people want to go fishing, I, I like to take them down to Casa Vieja or to Los Sueños. And, um, I ended up, uh, talking to them. I'm like, listen, I, I want to put something like this together. What's it cost for two people? And we're like, okay, cool. So two people, if yep. they want to add an extra day or whatever, that's up to them or an extra person, but, yep. uh, we're going to pay for two days of fishing for two people. And, um, whoever has, the, you know, you catch your first billfish, you got to take a video, you got to send it to us. We'll set up something. And, uh, as we do that, uh, we'll, we'll post it up on social and have a, a way for people to, uh, vote. Sure. Yeah. And That's a really cool idea, man. I like it a lot. Yeah. And it's one thing, you know, and I don't care where the, where you catch the fish. I mean, you can catch the fish in Costa Rica. You can catch the fish, catch the fish anywhere. I don't care. The whole thing is the video. I want the video of you getting thrown in and we're going to celebrate you catching your fish. And at that point, then we're going to, um, we're going to pick a winner and put it out there. And, uh, yeah, it's just fun. Again, like I said earlier, Too cool, if, man. Too if cool. it's not fun, I don't want to do it. <laughs> yep. I just, I just like to do not fun shit not what I was expecting you to say when you were like, Oh, I've got a, a competition that uh, we're getting ready to release, you know, and, uh, that's, uh, that's a really, that's a really cool. Yeah. Idea. Well, you were probably thinking think of an, be fun. another, you were probably thinking another fishing tournament. Yeah. Yeah. Which is, which is, Hey man, it's whatever. Yeah. It's another fishing tournament. And I'm, I love them. I love putting on, uh, we got a new one that we're doing here. Uh, Memorial weekend. It's funny. I've had like three emails about it since we've been on, uh, we're doing a statewide Mahi tournament uh, in the state of Florida from Key West to Jacksonville, 250 bucks. Oh, cool. Oh, cool. And then we have, um, we have two days worth of concerts. 
uh, while everybody's fishing, uh, we're going to have like two days worth of a uh, music fest going on in Fort Pierce, which is kind of like the middle of the state. It's right in the middle. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so anybody that wants to drive around, come in for some good music, stuff like that. So, uh, $250 buy-in? $250 buy-in. Uh, we're breaking it down to first, second, and third for Saturday and first, second, and third on Sunday. And uh, where, where anybody can afford – Where's the fence? Because I've seen some big mahi being caught in the Bahamas right now. You know what? And it's so funny you say that because at first I didn't put a fence, but right. I, I got to put something. Uh, so I'm going to, and there's there's a couple other little rules that I had to, that questions like this that come up. I don't want somebody going to the Bahamas for the weekend and then coming back. Yeah. Right. I, I don't want that, but I don't want to take away from the guys out of Canaveral that run over to the Noah buoy. I don't want to <laughs> say it's 50 miles because it all depends on where you're fishing. So yeah, yeah. I got to put some parameters on it and uh, we'll go from there. Uh, but it's 250 cool. bucks. If we can get, a th- if we can get a thousand boats, uh, that's pretty interesting. A thousand, yeah, bo- nice. a thousand boats would be a 50, 30, 20 uh, thousand split per day if we get a thousand boats yeah uh, even th- if even 300 boats would give us 15 10 5 so i just want people to go fishing i don't give a shit yeah. it is a 30 pound minimum so you can't bring in a 19 pounder and weigh it no i, I don't it, there is a, a 30 pound minimum i've had a couple people oh my god that's so big man i got a lot of these marinas that are weighing the fish it's mm-hmm. their busiest weekend i don't want people yeah. coming in weighing you know, a hundred fish or 40 fish, you know, you got somebody coming in weighing a 35 pounder. That's enough for the crowds to come in and some beer to be drank while people are weighing yep. it. That's a respectable Mahi for sure. Yeah. And, yeah. uh, and if not, we'll figure it out. You know, it's we, first uh, yeah, we hung a, uh, 39 pounder took first place in the white Marlin open 2016. And, uh, man, it was rough as a cob, but, uh, we had, uh, cracked a crack the shaft found a cracked shaft uh have you had a vibration on on a tuesday of the white marlin open and um went over on wednesday they said both shafts were cracked this was on the uh, on the 60 and they had uh viking pulled two shafts out of 62 and said it'll work put them back in thursday and then we fished the uh last day friday and it was like four to six footers blown his tail off really rough and and uh this mahi came i think i was on the left long rear and uh and this mahi came and, and you see it uh free jumping or uh or what the captain thought was free jumping through the spread well i had just gotten picked up and and here he comes and he's and he's jumping through the spread he's like how are not how's nobody picked up right now look at that look at that big mahi and uh, every time it jumped, there was just showering bait out of its mouth. I mean, it was just had a belly full, right? So, um, you know, we we cleared spread and everything, and uh, and one of the anglers, Josh, gets on it, and I always I always bust his chops because I feel like it was a world record uh, timeline or time frame of how long it took for him to reel this money in. Like, I mean. If, if we fought the Mahi for 40 minutes, I, I think that's, that, I think that's how long we fought it for. But, um, when it got up to the side of the boat, I mean, it, it was like a sheet of green plywood and we'd go up in a big swell and the fish would take a couple feet of line and it just laid there uh, that horizontal plane and we couldn't move it. We couldn't move it. And then we, then we'd get it, get it up close enough, just out of gap range, go back down for five feet. Ugh. But, uh, that was, uh, that was a 30, 39 pounds by the time we got back to the scales and weighed it. And, um, and, but man, that was a, that was a respectful mind. So, you know, 30 pound, 30 pound minimum, certainly, uh, you know, a, uh, a nice fish. It's respectable. And listen, oh, if yeah. I, if I come out and we only have four fish weighed for the state then I know I need to lower it. Sure. Uh, but if we end up with 10 fish weighed, or 20 fish way, then I'm, I'm like, no, 30 is perfect. Um, again, it's, it's respectable, but you know, it's so funny. You're talking about during a tournament, how many mahis you catch that are 30 something pounds during a regular day of fishing and you manhandle this thing and you catch yeah. it in like six minutes and you gaff it and everything's fine. But yeah, now right? it's a tournament. Oh no, yeah. I'm going to baby this thing. 
come on. And I, listen, I'm going to complain about it, but I know I've done it too. Oh my God. Oh my God. It's like, it's only 50 pound leader. It's like, you know what? Two yeah. days ago, it was only 50 pound leader. And I took a double wrap and I wired it and gaffed it all at the same yeah. time. And it didn't bother. Or, no- or you see some, they just sling it. They, they just sling them. They, they take a double or triple wrap and just yank them over the trans- yeah, or transom. You, you don't think nothing of it until it's, ter- until there's money riding on it. And then everybody Man, freaks out. A, uh, there's, there's a very weird feeling when you go to grab the leader in, in, a, in, a, in a big tournament like that. And uh, not knowing, you know, if you haven't seen the Marlin jump or the white Marlin or not knowing how big they are, you know, it's a, uh, it's a million dollar mess up possibly. Oh, no, no, no. Listen, I, I totally get, you grab a leader, you grab that 300 pound on a blue Marlin and you go to pull on it and it's like, oh, no, let me go easy. Any other day you take a full double wrap and lean on it. Yeah. Yeah. Instead it's a single wrap. And as soon as, as soon as you start to give you a little bit of a tug, you're letting go. You know, I, it's so funny because up in uh, Canada, when we're fishing, there's some days we got to go down as light as 150 fluoro to get them to wow. bite. You know, you're talking about an 800 pound fish. You'll be surprised how strong that fluoro is. Yeah. I mean, I am very, I, I've learned a lot. I've learned a lot about uh, fluorocarbon, wiring it, how much stretch uh or little stretch it has uh right. com- compared to regular monofilament and uh you you learn you know when you get to put that kind of a pressure on you you really start learning what your your tackle can do you guys still up on up on 100 pounds with the 154 oh <laughs> damn straight I, drag. Love, I love drag well yeah. they, they're circle hooks so they're supposed to be in the corner of the mouth right right in th- in theory mm-hmm you know what they say about theory and reality, but yeah, in theory sure. you can. Uh, and you know, sometimes do you make a mistake in something parts. Absolutely. But also at the same time, um, it lets you know what you can put on your, on your tackle. I want to know how much pressure I can put on my tackle. That's my sure. biggest thing. So that when you need to, you can. Yeah. You know, that's, that's a big thing. Are you reading comments? No, no, I don't have it set up. Uh, okay. I, w- I was worried going out of, uh, going out of my screen. I didn't know if that knocked me, uh, knocked me out of my, my video or not, but let's, uh, let's see here. You're here. You're loud and clear here. So, uh, every once in a while your, your mic goes, It'll give me a little okay. scratchiness, but all in all, you're, you, you're coming in clear, cool. which is for me is the most important. I want people to be able to hear what you're saying uh, when it's just audio. Cause a lot of people listen to it just on audio from Spotify, yeah. Spotify, what, um, or Stitcher or whatever. So what do you see in comments? Why is there um, anything you want to stop? Take a moment. No, out? no, no. I, right now it's a lot of uh, it's a lot of just idle chit chat. I will have to, uh, give a big round of applause. Uh, and one of the things I was checking out, see if I knew, uh, knew her, I see an Abby Jones is asking a lot of questions, making a lot of comments and let's, uh, let's give Abby a little love. Uh, she says she's recreational. She takes vets fishing, uh, for free. Uh, she got, uh, her first bluefin this year, those hooked, uh, bluefish for the kill. Um, and uh she said she will be ordering some of your rigor swivels uh and she also says putting waters on fish they light up and kids kid she loves to put kids on fish as well um and she loves having uh her own boat as well so and where uh where's where's abby where's she fishing out of i but if i'm correct abby was the one that was commenting out of moorhead city north carolina okay so, gotcha yeah yeah, yeah. No. uh abby there's no need to apologize she says sorry there's no need to apologize this is uh it's all good and fun uh i just yeah. I, I keep my so i i do all directing and production of the podcast myself while i'm on here with you so right. i've got my uh my screens here so i'm always bouncing between one screen comments the whole nine yards and i try to make it n- n- not too obvious uh yeah, yeah, yeah. 
now you're doing you're doing a good job <laughs> yeah so it's it's like i got three things at once and then you get the occasional emails that pop in uh and then uh there's a problem and then i gotta yeah. answer it like somebody just sent me an email can you do this uh sure i can do that maybe let me make sure it doesn't take away from the podcast yeah, so yeah, yeah. Yeah. um okay. that's that's my biggest well, thing i try sure. to do i'm not happy if i'm not doing 12 things at once i love yeah. doing a lot of things at once it's bunch it's, of tabs it's, open uh man, there's you know it's so funny we're fishermen i uh, grew up as a fisher uh yeah. no I, well i came i have a laptop but now i have three screens to go with my laptop i got my computer right. i've got lights all over the place uh if people didn't know what i do they'd walk in the house it's like what the hell are you doing man <laughs> what's, what's going on I in that room yeah so and it's funny because i i used to have an office up in american custom yachts then when covid started I, I created this office here in my house right. and little by little, I've just built out a whole studio and uh, everything happens right here. And I'm happy with it. I, I love it. Yeah, yeah, uh, for sure. I, I put on a collared shirt with board shorts and flip flops and I look professional, you know, <laughs> uh, everybody looks at me. Oh, ah, yeah, yeah. you're professional. No, I still got board shorts and flip flops. And most of the times my That's shirt great. does not match the shorts. Uh, I nah. got, I got blue. I got blue shorts on right now, so oh, that's cool. Uh, well, shout out to Abby while uh, while I'm still fresh for taking our veterans uh, out fishing. That's a really uh, really hits home for me. I'm a I'm a big supporter um, of our of our veterans for sure, and and uh, you know we uh, donate uh, regularly to Peppers Freedom Alliance Operation over in Costa Rica, where he takes a lot of our wounded vets and and uh, things like that out on you know these amazing trips whether it's fishing or uh their island tours and and uh, things like that it's just they deserve the uh, you know the love and and i, I just uh it gives me goosebumps whenever whenever anyone talks about or i see people taking care of them you know there listen i'm i'm a 100 percent big supporter of our veterans because of them we can sleep at night yep then you can sit in your board shorts and flip-flops on doing a podcast exactly i mean being the son of two immigrants from cuba uh yeah. listen every day i uh i i'm very very blessed i'm happy i there's no complaints on my part none Amen. whatsoever uh yeah. and abby has also uh let us know that she is one of your clients she's not only a watcher she's one of your clients so oh, nice. she said after you described this the ringer swivel she's like i got those on my boat oh cool yeah so cool. yeah our uh our bluefin guys uh really like the um our number twos and our number fours from new england all the way down to carolinas uh, in the winter time if they're live line uh for bluefin um you know they do a quick bridle and uh grab one of our number twos or our number fours uh depending on how big the bait is and how big your hook is but uh they've really uh really been doing well with them it's uh it's, it's been very interesting for something that uh you know, I had a single mind for ballyhoo rigging. That's all I wanted to do, right? So, you know, ballyhoo rigging is a little flawed, and I think I can make it a little better by putting these two together. Um, let's go ahead and do that. And then, you know, we have a customer say, hey, we, uh, I need a bigger one because I'm going to use them for this. And that's literally how ringer swivels grew to, you know, the four or five sizes that, uh, that we have now. It's just, hey, you know, need a bigger one. And now we've got guys in the Gulf of Mexico that are – bridling uh with a dart live tuna that that some sometimes are up upwards of 15 pounds and uh you know they're slow trolling them around the rigs and catching catching blue marlin we just had a uh, state record blue marlin uh zach on the floor de lease fishing the mongo offshore tournament uh they caught a state record blue marlin uh just with the uh with the bridal buddy dart at number four but just kind of seeing how, how the applications changed and even evolved into the tuna fishery. It's nothing that I would have ever expected um, or thought of, you know, originally. And it's just cool to see how, uh, how, how people are adapting with them. You know, it's funny how that happens when you put stuff out there, people, they adapt. Yeah. Fishermen really adapt. Sure. Uh, hey, I could use that with this, you know, ex exactly. And that's why a lot of times it's good just to put stuff out there. 
Uh, yep. You put it out there, see what happens and get the feedback. And um, it's the scientists call it citizen science. Yeah. Where you put it out to the citizens and then they adapt it, collect the information, get back to you. And then you can make the appropriate adjustments that you need. Absolutely. Yeah. Which people is, have caught cobia, uh, rooster fish and, and they're, you know, uh, bridling their live baits, even little live baits with them. And, uh, you know, our live bait swivel guys started using or wanted to, uh, wanted a ringer swivel that could accept the ringing bands and things like that for, uh, for the kite fishermen, the live bait sailfish guys in Florida and, and okay, here we go. And then next thing you know, someone's catching, using the same swivel, catching a rooster fish and another guy's catching cobia with them. <laughs> you know, the fish don't notice it. They don't, they don't notice it. Just like it's, I, I fished for four years in Venezuela in the nineties. Then I went back, uh, again in Oh six. And there were, we, there were some issues we had and we had to leave pretty quickly. And everybody that, was saying that about well, the time. Was that about the time Venezuela, um, no, they, they started going really downhill. I want to say it was probably another four years after that. Uh, we, our issue was, uh, um, boss being able to fly in and out. Uh, he, gotcha. at the time he flew private because of his health and we couldn't get the plane in to stay. There was a bunch of issues. So we went down there, we were there for a few weeks and then we left, uh, and everybody was, Oh, you left because of the political situation, this and that. I'm like, hold on a second. Time out. Whatever the political situation is, those fish don't know. No, they have no clue. They're going to bite. They don't yeah. care. They don't care what the political situation is. They're going to continue to bite. And, you know, I lived down there for four years in the late nineties and, you know, I flew down there a few times uh, to fish with my friend, Lee Alonzo on the bud man. And then we took the real tight down there in those six and the fishing was just as good. The fishing was just as good. The fish don't care. Um, now I miss it. I mean, I mean, the fishing by far, hands down, the best fishing I've ever seen consistently is Venezuela. Uh, as I've a heard whole, that. I've heard that more than once for sure. Yeah, it's you know. Now, mind you, I've had a couple other days that you know, the day we caught 120 sailfish out of Isla Mujeres, it was great. The fishing was phenomenal. Uh, I've had some really good days off of Florida. Um, you know, 40 or 50 bites. Best day I've ever had in Florida was 80 something bites. Uh, mm -hmm. and great days in Costa Rica and Panama, but consistently Venezuela. Yeah. I mean, and, and the opportunities are there for, for slams all day. You know, every from, day. From what, from what I hear. Every day. And it was, you know, during the fall, it was very, very easy to go through hundred to 150 baits every single wow. day every single day getting 30 to 50 billfish bites a day uh sometimes um getting a bunch of other bites it, too yeah that's as good as it gets man you know big tunas big dorados big wahoos uh i've watched the kids catch dolphin right off the the breakwater as you're going out they're right the kids are there <laughs> with hand lines catching dorados the uh, wow. little ponga boats trolling by the breakwater catching wahoos wow you know, Imagine that. Imagine being on the jetty in Ocean City catching yeah. wahoo. <laughs> That'd be pretty cool. I probably would. I probably wouldn't get on a boat and go go run I, ninety miles to go fishing if that was you, the case. <laughs> you know what? That kind of makes me feel bad because last year I was fishing off that South Jetty catching sheep's head. Uh, I should have been catching wahoos or dorados or something. Right. But yeah. long story I've, short, I've heard it, about that sheep's head bite. I want to get on that one time. I was uh, man. Uh, I'm trying to remember who who did we charter was a Johnny. Um, and we were just sitting there with a bunch of, uh, mole crabs, a bunch of, uh, sand fleas and catching sheep's head. Yeah. It was great. It was great. Re released every single one of them. Uh, yeah. but it was great. Uh, now hold on a second, Josh, we're going to have to fix that. I will introduce you to James boaters planet does not carry ringer swivel brand products. Uh -oh. uh, we'll have to hook you up. Uh, I will introduce the two of you. Um, uh oh, you're writing a note. Boaters uh, Planet, you know Josh Wilkinson. I uh, was listening to one of your podcasts the other day, um, where uh, where you were chatting chatting with him. Okay, yeah, you Josh. Called it the you called it the uh, quote me. 
the Amazon, the Amazon of fishing, uh, yeah. a fishing tackle, I think was your word. Uh, it was, yeah. it was the Amazon of boat parts. That's what it was. Yeah. Boat it parts, was the yeah. Amazon of boat parts. Um, that's how I describe it. And, yeah. um, he's based out of Arlington, uh, Virginia. And this is the biggest thing I have to give him kudos for. There's a lot of things I got to give him kudos for. The two biggest things is his son is cool as hell. Liam, he's a bad mofo. Yeah, it's just the wow. way he that's the way he rocks. But the other thing I got to give him kudos for, he has introduced me to the greatest trademark attorney imaginable. So, uh that big kudos to him. Uh, I I can never repay him for that. So, yeah. Um he he was always after me. Hey, you need to do this. You need to do it. I did it and uh I've been well taken care of. So that that's always a good thing in today's world. For sure, for sure. In today's uh, world. Cool. Uh, oh, we're, can we announce that on the air right now, uh, Josh? Uh, too bad. We're going to announce it one way or another. Boaters Planet is moving to Florida. <laughs> Uh-oh. Where about? I don't know. <laughs> uh, everybody else is. <laughs> uh, it seems like anybody from New York and California are moving to Florida or Texas. So yep. um, I have a we'll friend of mine. I have a friend of mine that uh, builds houses in the middle of the state and he, uh, he can't build them fast enough. He cannot build them fast enough. So uh, yes, uh, Josh, big, give Nadia a big shout out for me. Uh, she's awesome. I just spoke with her yesterday. Uh, we all are. Abby's moving to Florida as well. Everybody's coming down. So James, when are you moving to Florida? When are you uprooting the whole family and coming into the sunshine state? No, we were, I'll tell you what, to be honest with you, we were really close uh, back when I first met my wife in 2010. Um, I think we even had a couple neighborhoods picked out there um, in the Stewart area of uh, that folks had recommended as, you know, a good, good place to get a starter home, you know, uh, if you will. And, you know, I had uh, a year prior or, or maybe 2008, we had spent, um, not my wife and I, uh, spent three or four weeks down in Stewart and uh went sail fishing almost every day with captain robbie valco and uh in the moore family and it was that was that cut my teeth you know bill fishing underneath robbie valco and and rick carney would ride along a couple times and ski bow and and uh it was uh it was it's a cool fishery down there in the bahamas being so close and, and all the boating options and being uh you know really into boating and fishing I was like, man, I just, I got to get down there. I mean, and so many 12, options, so many places to go. It's 12 months out of the year. Yeah. Yeah. But so, we don't, uh, we don't have the hunting that you guys have in Maryland. No, nah, we got big deer. Yeah, you guys got me. <laughs> and, and it's so we, it, for people that don't understand deer hunting, um, like here in Florida, our deer are like dogs. They're not very yeah. big. We got tiny deer. And then you go up to some place like to, uh, Pennsylvania that have, nice body deer but no rack you know yep. and everybody talks about iowa and illinois and all these places missouri but right there on the eastern shore that little section right there produces some unbelievable bucks yeah the farm that a deer hunt on a buddy of mine uh was 180 189 i think deer shot two years ago and they routinely tried to manage them so that they're you know north of 150 and uh there's some big deer there's some big deer up here all around that's for sure that's that's awesome and then i uh i don't know if you know uh randy yates at all um runs the miss annie him and i gotcha. used to he him and i used to fish together on the topless in venezuela back in the 90s oh, nice. and uh after i got off the topless i think he did another year or two in st thomas and then he just kind of started fishing that ocean city maryland circuit and I stayed in the, the, the St. Thomas uh, Caribbean circuit. And I could, just because me and Randy are such good friends, uh, I could have definitely seen, I did not see the attraction to fishing Ocean City every year right. uh, because I liked St. Thomas. You get six months of blue marlin fishing. Hmm. Uh, but afterwards, and I started seeing all these, especially when social media kicked in, you're like, whoa, 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 whoa. I didn't. A couple of times I went to Ocean City, I never saw any of that. Yeah. Uh, um, and then I realized, no, I, I definitely missed out on that part of it. Uh, and listen, I'm not taking away for anything I've ever done. 
Uh, but I definitely missed that hunting side of it because we would stay in St. Thomas till November. And um, that's, you know, that's the majority of, of your hunting season. Uh, so there was a lot of things I missed out on, but there was a lot of things, you know, I, I didn't. Yeah. Uh, yeah. H- hanging There's in another little, uh, another little secret animal in the Eastern shore of Maryland that uh, people are probably going to be upset that I talk about, but, uh, but the sick of here is uh, oh. amazing. And it's such a fun, uh, such a fun, a little, uh, little animal to uh to hunt and target you know they view like a little mini elk and talk uh, a little bit about kind of dive into talk a little bit about the history of the sick of deer out there because it's only one little section that has them yeah yeah so um uh meat eater did a really good uh interview um with a biologist over at blackwater but basically there was uh originally maybe six four six sick of deer that were gifted to a gentleman that lived in Cambridge in the early 1900s. And uh, he kind of held them in captivity. And I think that they reproduced and got to a point where he couldn't um, manage them, or maybe he was getting older. Uh, forgive me if I don't have the story hundred percent correct, but uh, at some point in time, uh, he decided that he was going to take them out to this Island. I believe it was called James Island. And, um, and that was going to be where they were going to stay. And um you know, the, uh, I'm not sure what the swimming distance was or if the bay froze in that area that year or any of the other years after that. But ultimately, the sick of deer came off of the, uh, the island and continued to roam in, you know, Dorchester County and even down, uh, down towards Assateague right there in Ocean City, ultimately. And uh, I think a biologist had said on, on that podcast I listened to, it was somewhere north of over 20,000 of them in that area now. And, that's They're crazy. cool, but but if you're looking at antler sizes, I mean, like a like a really tiny six pointer is considered a, a 150, 160 inch white tail, you know, and they bugle and their hair stands up and and they're you know, they delicious. growl and make all sorts of noise, and they are delicious. A uh, a white tail tenderloin it would equal a sick of deer backstrap, or yeah, yep. And then to, to put a uh, comparison on a sick of deer tender one, I don't think there's anything in the world that, uh, that I could do. <laughs> you know, now that you say that now you're, you're, I might have to write this down. If I don't end up going to, uh, Nova Scotia, I might have to go up there and shoot a sick of deer. Well, we just got a, uh, we just locked in a really good lease and, uh, down in that area and I should have them pretty good. So, uh, you come uh then up I'm, and, I, uh, I, I might be calling you. That's fine. You I, come I, up October, so they they rut they rut a month earlier than the whitetail essentially, and uh, it's just bugling and growling and carrying on in the woods, and it's it's so cool. That's awesome. That is yep. so so cool. Uh, it's the only the only place in uh, only place in the country you can hunt them. That's uh, it's pretty amazing. I I've never hunted for them, but I've always heard some great things about them. Yeah, I didn't know they existed until four years ago. <laughs> Seriously? Oh yeah. Yep, okay. Wow. Yeah. I've. Yeah. I mean, I, I had them, but I never. I've never hunted for them. Yeah. And uh, and it's so funny because a sick of deer would look good, right about there, right next Agreed. to the Blue Marlin. Uh, and, I, and it's funny because actually in two weeks I'm going up to Wisconsin going turkey hunting. Oh, cool. And, and my buddy was like, "Are you going to mount the turkey?" I'm like, "I don't know. Maybe." Uh, I, I've never gone turkey hunting with a shotgun. I've yeah. shot turkeys, but I've only shot turkeys with my bow and arrow. No, uh, I'm, cool. I'm really into archery hunting. I love archery hunting. And I used to have a lease here in Florida. My first year, uh, my first, uh, turkey I ever killed was an Osceola here in Florida. Oh, cool. yeah. yeah. And here, I didn't realize everybody's thinking, oh man, that's the hardest one to get. And I'm like, nobody told me that. <laughs> you know, I, we found a tree that fell. We hid behind it and there they come. We put a turkey decoy and my buddy would call them and he could see him on the other side of the tree. And they couldn't, I mean, the whole root system had to be like seven feet high. So we're just oh, wow. almost standing there. Turkey comes by, I'm in full draw and there he goes. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. Archery, archery is like bill fishing. You know what I mean? It's a, there, there's an art to it you know there's a uh the skill set involved and a learning curve and it's not something anybody could just go out and and you know say i'm gonna go 
you know, Hook and Marlin, there's kind of an art to it. No, and, there's a, uh, there's a huge art and a patience to it. Sure. Yeah. There's an unbelievable patience to it. You have to be patient. And um, now talking about exotic animals or animals that have bred in their own captivity, I got a pretty funny story about whitetail. Um, ha have you ever been to St. Thomas? Nope. Want to. Okay. So when, uh, when you're heading out of Vesup Bay, which is where the marina is at, uh, we were heading out one day. And I knew there was deer there because I'd seen plenty of them. Um, well, my captain starts banging on the on the deck of the bridge. And I come running out because usually I gum up right before we, he pushes it up. And he starts banging and puts the boat in reverse. I'm like, something's wrong. And I come out, what's the matter? What? Get up here. And I'm like, shit, what did I do? And yeah. At first, I, you know, guilty conscious, man. What yeah. did I do? I don't know. Oh, and no. so I look and here's an eight pointer swimming across Vesa Bay. And you were talking about frozen ice or something. Mm -hmm. Vesa Bay ain't small. Vesa Bay is probably like 300 yards, wow. you know, two to 300 yards. It's wide. And here's this eight pointer swimming across. And as soon as he got past, you know, the channel, we went by him. And I mean, really, you could have put a gaff in him and brought him on board, but it would have been yeah. ugly. But <laughs> The deal was I started researching. So somewhere in the, I want to say early 1900s, uh, some people sailed down from Virginia and they brought some deer with them to farm them. And they cut them loose. And yeah. they're only on the east end of the island. They're not, they're, it's not like they run rampant all over the island. It's only on the east right. end between Red Hook and uh, Cabrita Point. And they swim back and forth. And just to protect the innocent, I'm not going to mention his name. He's not on this podcast. So anybody that's listening, <laughs> it wasn't me. But I do have a friend that used to go down there. And he did used to go hunting every year for him, bring his bow and arrow. And he'd sit oh, in the cool. woods and, and he'd shoot one. Nobody would hear yeah. him. It's not All like, right. you know, it's it's like anywhere else. With a bow and arrow, you can do just about anything. You yep. know? and yeah, they, they probably didn't have a uh, a regulated deer season down there do they uh you know what i don't know what if there was or what there wasn't i know there's no regulated season for the goats you can shoot all the goats you want oh wow and i never did it uh but the other two deckhands on the boat with me on the real tight they would go in our inflatable and with a shotgun <laughs> and they drive around in one of the islands and they do a goat call do you know what? Have you ever heard a goat call? Let me hear it. Hey, goat. <laughs> <laughs> That's it, man. <laughs> they'd pop these oh, things on funny. the side of the island and, you know, they'd shoot two or three goats uh, because every once in a while, these goats, they multiply so much that they actually have to go and eradicate them because they start getting yeah. sick. So uh, they would go and they'd shoot two or three of the goats and they come back and they clean them on the dock and they'd make curried goat or give them to the locals. There was no short. It, 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 it oh, would yeah. never go to waste. It would never go uh, to waste. Cool. Um, I'd, you know, sometimes I'd come back from uh, a week off and next thing you know, it's like roast goat, curried goat. It's like, <laughs> what kind of diet am I on? Is this like the new South beach diet? What the hell are we doing? Uh, here? Funny. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> goat it's goats it, but you know like i said uh you're fishing till november so you're missing some some hunting season yeah you, you still want to go out and harvest a, an animal or two and eat them and again uh i was never there but i believe there was one of the officials that actually gave them some shells to go out and kill the goats and give them the goat yeah he's like here's a box of shells and whatever you kill i'll take and they yeah, did bring me one yeah, no, he'd say, I'll take them all. It's like, okay, whatever. Oh, cool. You know, yeah. kill six of them, give them to one of the locals, you know, a, a local official, one of the government officials. Mm -hmm. And he'd come by in his pickup truck. You didn't have to clean them. You didn't have to nothing. Mm -hmm. You know? They, they say those Blue Marlin bites down in St. Thomas are some of the most aggressive bites that you get, huh? It's the, uh, now I have not fished Cape Verde yet. And I, I have a lot of friends that have, I was supposed to go last year, uh, COVID. I still, the, 
the uh, air pl- airline company still has my my credit. Uh, I was supposed to go last year, um, but they say that that Cape Verde is as close to St. Thomas as you ever seen. Uh, and my best way to describe it to everybody, because pitch baiting is so prevalent in St. Thomas, but one of the things yeah. that's that's helpful for pitch baiting and for people that don't understand pitch baiting or bait and switch is where you're pulling lures with no hooks in them, uh, which is just a teaser. And when a fish comes up, um, you tease the fish in and then you throw them a bait, uh, whether it be a rigged bait, uh, natural bait. Uh, we kind of perfected the use of the Tingham, uh, it was actually my boss that came up with the name of Tingham, uh, Jim Lambert, back in the day, uh, which is nothing more than a um, a Moldcraft soft head, a soft head Moldcraft uh, chugger. And uh, that's what we'd switch them off to. And th- it's great for a novice angler because if they miss it, you're not going to send Cocho. You're not going to, you know, yeah, he's yeah. not going to eat your bait. You just, he'll keep e- eating it over and over. So, um, but one of the things that I, when I talk to people about it is that the body of fish, when they move in there for the moon and you definitely, if you're fishing enough days in a row and when Jim was alive on average, our moons were 16 to 18 days long. Uh, sometimes they were a little shorter. Sometimes they were only 14 days. Uh, but sometimes they were 20 days. Um, And you can definitely see when a body of fish moves in. Um, and sometimes they move in in the middle of the day. Sometimes they, they come in overnight. Uh, but you can tell when there's a body of fish in. And when I talk about a body of fish, um, you know, when you're white marlin fishing or sailfish, you'll see a pack of fish because that's the way white marlin and sailfish hunt. They hunt like wolves. Right. You know, they yep. school a bait uh, and then they take their turn. Well, blue marlins are more individual like uh they do sometimes have small schools where they'll especially when they're smaller they'll hunt in two or threes or when they're mating uh you'll have a single big female and then two or three little males with her but on but on average they're 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 swimming alone uh individually but as a body of water there could be a whole body of fish there so Let's say in a square mile or two square miles, there could be a hundred fish. Uh, so they're not um, they're not in packs, but there's a body of fish in, in in your general water area. And when a body of fish moves in, um, you can definitely tell because they start getting more aggressive, and that's why the teaser fishing and the bait and yeah. switch works so well because they will stick with it because they know if they don't eat what they're chasing their buddy's yeah. gonna get it yeah yeah a little competition there's a little bit of competition and you can definitely Feast or famine right isn't that the uh that's exactly thing? that's exactly yeah. it. And, and you can definitely tell when there's not a lot of fish on the drop um they're all long rigger bites yeah or center rigger bites and you might get an occasional bridge teaser bite but when there's a lot of fish they're all bridge teaser bites you know, they're, they're getting more aggressive and they'll stay with you. And on average, over the course of a moon cycle or even a, over the course of a season where you're there for six months, uh, your average is probably going to be 50% bridge teasers, 30% short rigger teasers, and then your long riggers, whatever you got in the longs uh, right. on average. And then once uh, dredges got introduced or bowling pin uh, daisy chains, that could have maybe even been changed to 60% bridge teasers and then uh, 25, 15. Yeah, I yeah. want to get down there for sure for uh, it, for a full moon at the drop, man, when it's going off. You know? it's, uh, there was one September in 02, and I, I have the book. I have my log somewhere. I want to say in that one moon, we had 97 bites. Mm. It was 17 <laughs> days of fishing. Um which is still nothing compared to what you see in Costa Rica. Uh, but it's, it's a totally different thing. And, and I'm not one of those grumpy old guys that talk about, Oh, fat fishing don't count. Hey man, fishing is right. Fishing. right. My job is to catch yeah. whatever's available. That's my job. Yep. I'm going to catch whatever. And if you, uh, if you catch them around a fad, so be it. 
I, I don't, I'm not going to sit here. Uh, if you catch 18 in a day, I'm not going to poo poo your good day. I'm going to say congratulations. And uh, yeah. it's, it's, it's different than when I grew up, but I'm not going to poo poo it. Cause uh, you know what, when I first grew up, uh, an 18 knot boat was fast, you know? Yeah. Um, so things change and we and now, adapt now, tw- now 28 slow. Yeah. And here's the thing back then we didn't have ringer swivels. So yeah. think of how many more fish we would have caught with ringer swivels. You would have, you would have caught a lot more. I would have crushed. You know? I would have crushed. Yeah. Who knows? I, maybe I would have been famous if I had ringer swivels. Now could've I'm been. just, a, could've been. I'm just a short, hairy Cuban guy. <laughs> famous for a sticker. That, that, that somebody That's took a picture of when he was holding the fish. I'm not even famous. famous I'm just, sticker. I'm just well known because of the sticker that somebody else made. <laughs> no, that's funny, man. <laughs> so, um, on that note, is there anything that you wanted to talk about that we haven't talked about? Did we miss anything? Um, and here's the, uh, listen, did you get any love notes on your text that you want to like add to or something? I mean, yeah, Sean, Sean Carpenter, ASW, that beard is strong. Well, you know, I did not want to say anything about your, your beard, but now that Sean brought it up, I, I got to jump on it. So yesterday you said work in progress. So yesterday, oh, that leads me into another story. But yesterday when you sent me the picture of you at work with the mask on, yeah, I'm, yeah. Like, I'm like, dude, that's a very unkept beard. And <laughs> but uh, you had the mask and it was like when after i fly my, yeah. my goatee comes out it looks like a tarantula right it, it really does it looks like uh, a playboy centerfold in the 80s uh, That's funny. Not, <laughs> not not good uh but talking about uh the beard is strong and it's a work in progress uh when i was running that boat in hawaii the guy i i worked for was from texas and we were planning a mule deer hunt in uh raton new mexico he's he tells me is that your wife yeah yeah she was hi honey th- thank you for allowing wow. your husband to talk for an hour Why and 36 hi, minutes <laughs> i'm gonna cut him off here shortly after i'm done with my beard story there you and go. i was uh i was one of them very fortunate or unfortunate kids that was able to shave in the sixth grade i was in elementary yeah. school i had a beard whole night or mustache anyway and so uh, my boss tells me, hey, listen, we all grow a beard when we go hunting. And I'm like, yeah, I can do that. That's not a problem. And I'm like, when we hunt on December 7th, I'm like, okay, count me in. I'll, I'll fly out to, your, to the ranch for Thanksgiving. And then we'll drive up to New Mexico in, in your um, whatever bus uh, RV. Right. And so I fly in like the Monday before Thanksgiving and I shaved on Sunday. And I didn't have a goatee. I was clean shaved. And he's like, hey. <laughs> we're supposed to grow a beard and everybody at the ranch, they're all patch here and patch there. And it's right, right. not coming in very good. And, uh, there he's yelling at me. You're supposed, we're supposed to grow a beard. I says, I am. I quit shaving yesterday. <laughs> and he's like, there's no way. There's no way. That was Monday. Uh, the day after Thanksgiving, they're like, F you, man. I can't believe you did that. <laughs> yeah, man. And, it's just one you know it's just one of those things i was i've been very lucky i grow a beard um and normally up and when i go to canada i quit shaving as soon as i go up and by the time i'm said and done i got a full beard and i keep it for the whole fall and that's you know my hunting beard and i travel until after christmas yeah every year for christmas my girlfriend and i i have she doesn't have children either so what we do is we just go somewhere cold. That's my only thing. I want to go somewhere and enjoy cold because in Florida, it doesn't seem like Christmas. We've gone yeah. to Norway and we've gone to upper Michigan. We've gone to Colorado. We go wherever, as long as it's cold and I can enjoy my beard. And right after the new year, I chop that shit off. So, yeah, you know, yeah, it, this is my mind, the hunting season beer that I kind of, uh, I've always experimented with kind of letting it go as long as, as long as I could to see if I could fill in just a little bit. And this year has been my best run. So I'm going to hold on to it for a little bit longer. Whoa, 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 whoa. wait a second. It's, it's April, dude. It's you, hunting season. It's either hunting seasons way past due or you're way it's early. Season. Oh, okay. 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 
I didn't usually duck commander does not come into effect for turkey season. Turkey season is, is true. getting ready this for you getting ready for your beach bod. Yeah. And yeah, and, and let me tell you, in my world, pear is a shape. Mm. Pear yep. is a shape. So uh on that note, uh you stick right there. Uh don't hang up. I want to James, yep. I want to say thank you very much for joining Absolutely. us on the podcast uh yes. and sharing your stories. And uh, I want to thank you everybody. Did ask if I had oh, oh sorry, go one ahead. one little thing I wanted to throw in before we go hang up now. Um when uh when Ring of Souls first started, uh, you know, the um we basically have made a change uh, to the strength of the O-ring um, that, that started, uh, I believe we released the change in July of this past year. So for any of our potential customers or folks that have tried them and may have had some issues, we basically needed to innovate alongside of these hook companies that were building these, these smaller, thinner wire hooks. And every now and then guys would have a bait walk off with, uh, with the old ringer swivel. So I uh, went back to the drawing board, made them twice as strong, half the stretch, and then did that again with our number twos. So our number ones and number twos are now twice as strong, and uh, they really pop past the barb to get them on and off. And uh, they're a really, really good fit, really strong. And uh, so just want to throw that little update out there for anyone who may have played with them before and you know you, may have their doubts that we've. Would you like to give out? Your, up. Would you like to give out your home address in case somebody wants to complain? I'm sure your wife would love the company. Now put them in, put them in your box and then you send them to me. <laughs> My complaint box. Yeah. The one out front. Exactly. I'm not uh, going to tell nobody where it's at. So, but now that's my, that was my only little, uh, little, uh, thing I wanted to mention, you know, that, uh, we did some improvements and, uh, everyone's really happy with them and, you know, guys are winning money all over the world using them. And what, and what is that the, we, what is the official number right now? Uh, just a hair north of 8.9 million. 8.9 million has been won using your product. Yeah. And, and that's not like, oh, we caught it on the lure. It was the ringer swivel was on the bait that hooked the marlin or the mahi or, you know, the winning tuna during the mid Atlantic or white marlin open type stuff. The ringer swivel was responsible for holding that bait and that circle up together and, and making it all come tight. So that's, that's pretty cool. It's crazy. It's it's neat Crazy. to see but something like that. I love it. I, I, I know it. I, I get, I, I enjoy shit like that. Yeah. yeah the you have an idea that, like I said, it's, just been overwhelming. That's cool. That's cool. So, yeah. all righty guys and gals and miss Abby, thank you so, so much uh, for taking your time to listening to us today. James, thank you so much for your time and your kids for not eating peanut butter and jelly today. Uh, <laughs> everybody, well, thank you it. so much. Uh, and you can listen to this along with everything else uh, on whatever your favorite podcast broadcasting platform is. So everybody, thank you so much. Peace out. Let me find my little cursor here so I can hang up properly. Uh, James, again, thank you so much. And everybody else, yeah. have a good time. And I will talk to you later. See ya.